Hey there, uh, this is the second half of the Max 1B Taylor series um, revision seminar um, that I'm recording to an empty room because I didn't do the recording properly when I did it yesterday. And I'm continuing on from where I left off. And where I left off um, was I was just about to talk about errors for Taylor polynomials. Okay, so here's the philosophy of this. Um, you've got a function and it's not a polynomial. Maybe it's something like that. Um, and you have a particular point, your center of your Taylor series, which is A. Uh, and then you also have um, a Taylor polynomial. Okay, so your first Taylor polynomial will be a straight line, which will be the tangent to this at point A. The second one will be a parabola, the third one will be a cubic, and, and there will be, you know, various polynomials. Uh, and the idea is that the polynomial will match your function when it's very close to A. It will definitely be exactly equal to your function at A. And it will be very close to your function when it's close to A, and the further away from A it is, the less accurate the approximation will be. Uh, and so we're going to have something like, it'll be really close, closer than, than the naked eye can see. It'll never be exactly on the line. Um, it's, it might cross the line sometimes. And then it'll start to sort of get worse the further away it goes. Okay, uh, this one's an odd tailor polynomial because it's going up at one end and down at the other. Um, and somewhere in the middle, it's quite close. That's the idea behind it. So this will be P N X and this one is F X. But if we could zoom right in on this bit here, um, we'd find out that actually when we were really, really, really close to that point, the Taylor polynomial was actually not uh, only crossing it at exactly the point A. So there's my magnifying glass, uh, and I zoom in. And here's my curve doing what it does. And my Taylor polynomial is sort of like that. So there's my dotted line that goes down to A. And if I'm very close to A, but not quite at A, maybe I'm at the point X here. Um, and here's the line that comes up from X. I'll find that there's actually a small difference between the Taylor polynomial and the function itself. Here's the Taylor polynomial's value. And here is the function value. And there's a little distance between them. And that little distance between them is the error. So this is just putting y's on there. So this value here is pn of the particular x that I'm interested in. This value here is f of the particular x that I'm interested in. And the distance between them, that's rn x. Now, um, R in X will be positive or negative, depending on whether it's um, whether your Taylor polynomial is above or below the function. Um, but it might be the other way around, below or above, depending on how you calculate um, that. So at the moment, it looks like it's F X minus P N X, which will give me a positive number. But some people calculate it as P N X minus F of X, um, in which case that would be negative. Um, and in order to just account for all of that, we just say that the distance is the absolute value of that. And mostly we're not interested in actually whether it's above or below, but we're interested in what the, act, what the size of that is, so we do the absolute value. Okay. So, um, I'm going to uh, exaggerate 
uh, the distance between the Taylor polynomial and the function just so that we can draw this graph more easily. Here's my a, here's my function, here's my Taylor polynomial. y equals bn x, y equals f of x. Here's my point x. And this is the error here. Just to draw that same picture again. Right. Now here's the thing. We would very much like to know how far our Taylor polynomial is from our y at any given point. You'll see at different points x it's a different distance away, which is why this is rnx. It's a function of x. Every x has its own different um, distance. As you get closer to a, the distance between fx and pnx gets closer and closer and closer. As the n increases, the distance gets smaller as well. Um, and we'd like to estimate how big that is. If it was possible for us to know the precise distance between our function and our Taylor polynomial, we probably wouldn't need Taylor polynomials. Because if we knew the exact distance between it, well, we would be able to figure out our function exactly, uh, and we wouldn't need a Taylor polynomial, which is in general used to, count, to approximate a function. Or if we had a good formula for it, um, it's possible that that formula for that would need a Taylor polynomial of its own. Um, so yes. So we can't figure it out exactly. Okay, and it, because if we could, there wouldn't be a point of, of, of needing any of this crap anyway. We'd just be able to figure out all functions exactly as they are without needing to approximate them in polynomials. So we can only approximate it roughly. And Taylor has this theorem that roughly approximates the error. It, it says that theoretically there is a way of calculating the error. But it, he leaves some important feature out, which means that we can't calculate it exactly. So here it is. Rnx. In fact, it looks exactly like the next term in your Taylor series. Okay? Except, instead of putting A in this spot, we put some other number in that spot. If we put a in that spot, it's totally not going to be the error because um, you know that the real function is the infinite Taylor series um, and this is only the next term. So the error is actually the next term and all the ones after it, um, all joined together into a single function. Um, and so it can't possibly put in, be putting an a there because that, that's not going to give me all the terms. And so the idea is that it, I could try different numbers. Instead of putting a in there, maybe I could put in a and a little bit. Um, or a and a bigger bit, or a minus a bit. Um, so I could try different numbers in that spot, and so maybe one of them will give me the correct answer for the error. And in fact, that's the idea. If you tried all the numbers between a and x in this spot to figure out a formula, for, to figure out an answer for what the error is, then one of them, somewhere in the middle, will give you the correct answer for the error including the plus or minus as to what direction the error is in. Okay? So that's the key here. That z, it says that if you've got an x and you sub it in um, to figure out, sub it into this to figure out the error, if you just, there is a z somewhere that is the correct z that will produce the right answer for the error. But the problem is with Taylor's theorem, damn Taylor or possibly poor Taylor, there, you don't know which z it is. If you knew which z it was, you wouldn't need to calculate the error because you'd be able to calculate the function exactly. So, um, it's not that completely bad though because you do know that a is somewhere between, that z is somewhere between a and x. You don't have to try all possible z's, you just have to choose the z's between a and x. For some z between a and x. Okay. Here's the thing, though. How can we estimate the error then? You know, we don't know what z is. 
So what we can do is we can figure out what the error formula would give me if I tried all these different z's. And you know one of them is the right answer. And so, so these are all the options that it could be based on different z's. If I just choose the biggest one, then I know the error can't be any worse than that. I know it's one of these options, I'll just pick the biggest option and it can't be worse than that. That's the idea behind it. So what we actually do is we line everything up and we find out what the error could be. So we... Here's A, here's X, and these are not, is no longer an X axis, it's the options for Z. Okay, and it may be that when I draw the height that represents the error, I draw Rnx for different values of z. One of them is the correct answer. It's, uh, let's see. That one just there. That's the correct Rn. Okay, that's the correct z that produces um, Rnx up there. But I don't know which one it is. I don't know which z that is. And so what I do is I go, well, that's okay, because this one over here is the worst case scenario. The worst error for any z, um, and so I'll choose this one. That's the worst case scenario. Okay? So the idea is that we have to draw a graph of what Rnx is for different values of z, or at least imagine drawing one, and think to ourselves, well, um, we don't. know where the correct one is. Um, and so we'll pick the worst error, and that's the one we'll do. In practice, you don't have to actually draw the entire of Rnx. You only have to draw this bit here. OK. So let me do an example. f of x is sine 2x. Part A will find the fifth Taylor uh, p5x at x equals pi on 4. Uh, and uh, we will find, find the error, well, estimate the error. Estimate the error um, for uh, when x equals uh, 0 0.8. Okay? Which is quite close to pi on 4. Pi on 4 is about 0.7. Alright, so here's how we're going to do it. And part b will be what does n have to be to guarantee that Pn uh, 0.8 is within 0, 10 to the minus 20 of f of 0 0.8. I've chosen a really, really big number because of what's going to happen when I do this first part of the problem. OK, so let's do part A. Well, I'm going to need to figure out the Taylor series. Now, I could conceivably, I could conceivably figure out the Taylor series 
by getting the Taylor series for sine x and subbing in um, 2x into it, and that would give me the Taylor series. But the problem with that is that you cannot estimate the error from the terms in the Taylor series. You can only get it from the derivative. You see, if you figure out what the terms in the Taylor series actually are, um, then uh, what's going to happen is there'll be an A here, and it'll all be wrapped up in with this um, n plus 1 factorial, and you won't be able to figure out what it would be for the z that you need. And so, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to tell. And so you're going to need to actually find the actual derivatives. So this is sine 2x. f dash x is cos of 2x, but we'll have to multiply by a 2. f double dash x would be um, minus, there'd still be a 2. Um, I'll get a sine 2x, but it'll be a minus sine. Um, but I'll have to multiply by a 2 because of that there. f triple dash x will be 2 times minus 2. Now, the sine will differentiate to be a cos 2x. Uh, and then uh, I will get uh, a, a plus 2 coming out. f 4x will be 2 times minus 2 times 2 times now. Uh, the cos will become a minus sign and another 2 will come out and f5x will be 2 times minus 2 times 2 times minus 2 times and then a 2 will come out oh, and it will become a cos of course by then So let's see if I've got, uh, and then f6 will be 2 times minus 2 times 2 times minus 2 times 2 times, and we'll get a, a minus because it will turn, because that's what you get when you differentiate cos and another 2 will come out. Let's just check if we've got that right. The cos will become a minus sign but with a 2. That sign uh, will become a cos but with an extra 2. Yes, okay. Now, you may think that that was a strange way to do it, of not actually figuring out what the number is um, at each stage. I should probably have gone like minus 4, and then the next one's minus 8, um, and then the next one's uh, 16, and then the next one's 32. I could probably have done that. However, um, I haven't expanded it out for what I mentioned in the other part of the seminar, because I'm going to need eventually in part B a formula for Rnx. And I can't figure out that formula unless um, I know how this thing was constructed. However, at this stage I can certainly figure out what it is. So I've got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2 to the 6, and 1, 2, 3 minuses. Okay. And so um, Rnx will be minus 2 to the 6 sine 2z, that's the f6z, over, uh, sorry, r5. We're doing the fifth error. Um, so this is where we get up to, the fifth error. Um, and then we need to go to the next Taylor polynomial. 6 factorial uh, x minus uh, pi on 4 to the 6. Okay. So it's the error in the fifth Taylor polynomial and to get it we need to go to the sixth derivative. Now, we're going to need to figure out um, when uh, we use x equals 0.8, uh, when that's going to be, um, well, what that answer is. Okay, we don't know what that answer is, so we're going to estimate it and do a worst case scenario. So what we really want is R5 0 0.8 minus 2 to the 6 sine 2z 0 0.8 minus pi on 4 6. 
over 6 factorial and we know that z is between 0 0.8 and 0 and pi on 4. Now we need to know which way round 0 0.8 and pi on 4 are so that we can draw our diagram. So let me just go Try that again. Okay, so this is approximately equal to 0 0.78 um, uh, and so uh, I'm going to do this. Here is 0 pi on 4 and here is 0 0.8. Uh, and these are going to be my options for z. And this height here is going to be the sine 2z. Okay, so sine 2z, uh, let's see. Sine 2z would, would um, have its turning points, uh, would do the, the thing that sine does twice as fast. So normally sine uh, starts here and turns at pi on 2 and then comes down, uh, turns at pi on 2 and then comes down, so for the pi on 4 it will actually turn at pi on 4 and then come down, uh, and uh, actually it's not going to come again until pi on 2 which is way away, which is like another, another 0.75 away. So it looks like this is my curve here for y equals sine 2z. And so, my worst case scenario for the error is here. Which makes sense, I suppose. I suppose sine of anything can be at most 1. So if you didn't have enough time, even to actually look at what the maximums and minimums were in this zone, you could say, well, the sine is no more than 1, and so I can just replace that with a 1, and it will give me a really rough estimate. And so... Um, Largest outcome for sine 2z occurs at x equals pi on 4 when sine 2z is 1. So therefore the absolute value of R5 0 0.8 is less than or equal to times 1. So I've replaced I've replaced um, the, the sine 2z with a 1 because that's the maximum possible value and this will be and I'll just figure out what that is so 2 to the power of 6 Power of six and then I'll divide that by six fact sorry about that. Let me just try that again. I'm using a calculator on the computer rather than a proper calculator, I'm sorry. Two to the power of six and then we'll divide that by uh, 6 factorial uh, and then we'll multiply it by uh, 0 0.8 minus pi on 4 Oh crap. Just give me a second. Right. And that is uh, 8.6 times 10 to the minus 13. Okay. So that's my um, error. We got it to about 12 decimal places. Because uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 13 would be 12 decimal places. So that's about right. Okay. So that's part A. Part B. Uh, was, let's just go back and check that, uh, what does n have to be to guarantee that pn 0 
uh, is within 10 to the minus 20 of f of 0 0.8. Okay. So now we want to know, find n so that rn 0 0.8 is less than 10 to the minus 20. All right. Well, we're going to need a formula for Rn. Um, and so we're going to have to go back to our original list. We're going to go have back to our original list and try and figure out uh, what it is. Let's see. And this is why I didn't expand it out. Because I want to use the information I have to try and figure out what the formula is. Okay, so let's look at this. I have one, two, three, four, five, six twos here. One, two, three, four, five, five twos there. One, two, three. So it looks like it's two to the power of n. R n x is two to the power of n, uh, and we have. One, two, three in this one, two in this one, two in this one. Oh, okay. So every second one of them is different. Um, so since every second one's different, um, I could try and do a thing uh, with a two. Well, actually, no. I can only really do either the odds or the evens. Okay. So um, when because the um, Yes, and really, just like with the Taylor series, is, so they're all like 2n plus 1s or 2n's. Uh, we don't have any at the moment that have two different formulas, but that may, co may come to you in the future in a future maths course. So maybe I'll just do the even ones. I mean, actually, just a second, the odd ones, if I sub in pi on 2, I'm going to get 0 there anyway. So that's not particularly helpful. Um, yeah, let me just do the even ones. So if n is even, I've got 2 to the n. So the even ones, when it's 6, there's 1, 2, 3. When it's 4, there's 1, 2. When it's 2, there's 1. Okay, so that's n on 2. Uh, and then it's sine 2x. So just a second. Let's not do it as rnx for the moment. Let's just say fnx. Is that? And it's sine 2z. Okay, so that's my formula for the nth derivative based on what I had before. And now let's try and figure out what Rn um, is. So Rnx is 2 to the n minus 1 to the n on 2 sine... Sorry, that's not a z yet. Sine 2z over... Ah, crap. It's not going to be that, because this is the nth derivative. We need the n plus 1th derivative. So I'm going to have to change all these n's to n plus 1's. n plus 1 factorial, and it's uh, x minus pi on 4 to the n plus 1. Okay. Uh, cool, that's Rnx. I'm in the absolute value of Rnx. would be the absolute value of each of these things separately. So the absolute value of 2 to the n plus 1 is still 2 to the n plus 1. The absolute value of uh, minus 1 is 1. The absolute value of sine 2z. The absolute value of sine n plus 1 factorial is that. The absolute value of this, well, x minus pi on 4 is positive anyway, but just for completeness's sake, I'll just put that in. All right, and what we want is for that to be um, less than 10 to the minus 20. But I will put the 0.8 in. Uh, okay. And then, sweet, uh, we can... Um, trial and error, really. We'd like that to be less than 10 to the minus 20. So really, trial and error is the best plan. Oh, just a second. There's still a z in this formula. 
We can use the same reasoning as before to say that sine z, uh, maximum value of sine z is 1 in that zone. So um, for z between pi on 4 and 0 0.8, the maximum value of sine 2z, sorry, is 1. So Rn 0 0.8 is less than or equal to 2 to the n plus 1 times 1 over n plus 1 factorial 0 0.8 minus pi on 4 to the n plus 1 which we want to be less than 10 to the minus 20 and this is the point at which trial and error is probably the best plan we've already done 5 and we know that that one was 10 to the minus 13 so it's not far enough so let me go to my calculator and try it with um, uh, with the next number. Okay. So R5 0 0.8 um, is less than it's approximately well, is less than or equal to 8 times 10 to the minus 13, uh, 6, 0 0.8, which will use a 7, um, 2 to the 7, etc., is less than or equal to 8 times 10 to the minus 15. Uh, okay, this is for n even though, isn't it? Oh, crap. Ah, so I'd have to do this one for n odd, wouldn't I? If I go back here, this only works when n is even. I put in n plus 1, but the formula only works when n plus 1 is even, so I'm going to need to use n odd. Okay, so R5 was that. R7 is the next one, uh, which will use the number 8 in the formula. Nine times ten to the minus seventeen. And R nine uh, we'll use ten in the formula. Oops, today, sorry. Which is 1 times 10 to the minus 21. So there we are, we're far enough. Actually, I think I did something wrong back there. Forgot to put in the extra number in the factorial. 22. And the previous one, when it was 9, when it was 9, no, when it was 8, is 1 times 10 to the minus 17. Okay, so now it's far enough. So I need n to be greater than or equal to 9. Right. Um, and that will do the trick. I'm sorry that was a bit of a confusing example because of the, um, the odd and even thing. So maybe I'll just do one more um, when it doesn't work out that way. Um, and so let's do like um, n have to be for um, n Taylor poly for f of x which is equal to say 
uh, ln x at x equals uh, 2 to be within 10 to the minus 3 uh, maybe 10 ok so f of x is ln x f dashed of x is 1 over x f double dashed of x uh, is minus 1 x to the minus 2 f triple dashed of x is minus 1 minus 2 x to the minus 3 f uh, 4 of x is minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 x to the minus 4 f 5 of x is minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 minus 4 x to the minus 5 I think I've gone far enough to be able to figure out the, the pattern now so let's see um, Let's see, we have minus 1, so each one of them has an extra minus, there's 1 minus when it's 2, there's 2 minuses when it's 3, there's 3 minuses when it's 4, so it looks like fnx uh, has got minus 1 to the n minus 1, um, then it goes 1 times 2 times 3, 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, and that number is 1 less than the number we're using, so it's n minus 1 factorial, and x to the minus n. And we're going to need n plus 1. So I'll sub in n plus 1 into this, n plus 1 minus 1 would be n, n plus 1 min n minus 1, n plus 1 minus 1 would be n again, and we have x to the minus 1. Okay. Alright, and so therefore, r n x at any particular point uh, would be minus 1 to the n plus no, yep, I'm just using the f n plus 1, so that's this thing here, minus 1 to the n, n factorial z to the minus n plus 1, divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus 2 to the n plus 1. That is my formula, and remember that this is this, but with a z in it. Doing well, we can do a bit of cancelling. N, n factorial divided by n plus 1 factorial is um, n plus 1 on the bottom. So n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n times n minus 1 and so on. n is factorial is n times n minus 1 and so on. And so most of them are going to cancel out. And so I'm going to get minus... Actually, let's just... No, I won't. I'll do that in two different steps. Minus 1 to the n over n plus 1 z to the minus n plus 1 x minus 2 to the n plus 1. Uh, um, I just need to give us a point for the n telco to be you know, at the point. Uh, at the point uh, x equals say 2.1. Okay. Okay. All right, doing well. So R n, the absolute value of R n x, the minus one will go away. X minus two to the n plus one, absolute value there, and so the absolute value of zero uh, of two point one uh, z to the minus n plus one over n plus 1, absolute value of 2.1 minus 2 to the n plus 1, which is 1 over n plus 1 z to the n plus 1 times 0 0.1 to the n plus 1. That's great. We're doing well. So now we just need to do this thing. So when is this function um, the smallest? So here we have 2 and 2.1. We know the z is somewhere in between. And we need to draw this function. So 1 over z to the n plus 1 is decreasing on this zone. So the maximum value is here at 2. So max 
value of 1 over z to the n plus 1 is at z equals 2. And so we get that the Rn of 2.1 is less than or equal to 1 over n plus 1 2 to the n plus 1, 0 0.1 to the n plus 1. Okay, doing well. And so this would be equal to, um, I might bring those two things in, in um, to the same power. We have 1 over n plus 1 times 0 0.1 over 2 n plus 1, which is 1 over n plus 1 times 0.05 to the n plus 1. Right, and we want that to be less than 10 to the minus 10. Okay, 10 to the minus 10. So this is where I'd start to do some, some um, trial and error. Um, I'm guessing though that 0.05 is already sort of um, less than 10 to the minus 1. And so I'm thinking that my n plus 1 is going to have to be close to uh, it's going to have to be maybe 9-ish. I'll try 9 and see what we get. So n equals 9. Rn 2.1 uh, is less than or equal to... Let's see. 1 over 10 times 0.05 to the power of 10. So that's 9.7 times 10 to the minus 15. So that's too small. So let's try n equals 8. That's 13. It's gone down by 2 and we need to go down another 3. So I'm thinking n equals 6. I might, um, so maybe let's try n equals 6. Point 0.1 times 10 to the minus. Um, 10. Okay, so that's not quite small enough yet. It's a little bit more than 10 to the minus 10. So it looks like um, with the 7 in between we'll get a bit lower because um, you know that the error always gets smaller for bigger uh, n. And so it looks like we need n is greater than or equal to 7. And that will complete that example there.